Well, god darn, ain't she just a picture? Ah, the charming Mr. Larson. Has Pierre let you off the leash? Talking of which, where is our learned friend? Oh, he's around. You got the cash? I've got the cash, but I don't deal with the monkey. <laughs> If I was you, I'd grab your Cro-Magnon cowboy over there and run as fast as your little legs can carry you. Au revoir, mon cher. Lara, you promised! Boo! <gasps> is this just me, or is Lara a bitch in this game? Or maybe her friends were remembering her as being such. So, Tomb Raider Chronicles, the last pillar of the Acropolis of the originals, the last of the grid-like tank controls driven stories about our favorite artifact snatcher, I mean permanent treasure borrower. This one should go out with a bang, a big explosion, you get it. But did it actually go? Yeah, no. To be honest, I didn't have too many memories of playing Tomb Raider Chronicles back then when it came out. Mostly because I was already dead tired of Lara Croft and I was more interested in the upcoming PS2 console with the new games. And of course, I was more interested in the Angel of Darkness since core design promised something entirely new. New game for the new generation. Don't get me wrong, I was playing Chronicles, but not too much. Even then, the game felt like... I don't know how to sum it up properly. It felt like a contract obligation at best. Yeah, that's right. A forced out work just because somebody demanded it, not because there was the initial desire to do it. As we all already know, the intention to get rid of Lara Croft in the last revelation so the core design can move on to the new project has immediately failed. They were so naive in thinking that there was a way to shove the Tomb Raider IP into the drawers of yesteryear. So they needed to convey a quick plan to counter this problem. One trip into a local pub and several drinks later and some of the ideas started to flow in. What if Lara Croft accidentally slipped in the shower, got unconscious and dreamt her Egyptian adventure? At least, that's what was written in one of the old interviews with the core design devs in the year 2000. The general idea of Lara's friends reminiscing about her adventures was done probably in an hour, which was an easy part. The only thing left to do is to make a game, right? Oh man, not again. I mean, if you're going to use the same old engine for the fifth time, things should be fast, right? The technology is already there, and all you have to do is design some levels, only 13 this time, if you count this short deep sea dive section right here. That's even less than the number of levels in Tomb Raider 1. And of course, throw in some new gameplay ideas, fiddle with the 4 short stories, and that's it. Ok, now it sounds like this is a lot of work, but as usual, Core Design was able to do it in a year. This time, not without some bugs. Game breaking bugs, unfortunately, to be exact. But I'll tackle those later on. Lara Croft is dead, or is she? Ok, for the sake of the FME animation and the story, she's dead. Under the gloomy shades of rain and occasional cracks of lightning accompanied by the melancholic tune first played as a background for the previous Tomb Raider menu comes the statue of Lara Croft representing her epitaph. A sad situation joined by her trusty loyal butler Winston arranging the flowers and two people standing aside mourning her death. Are they her parents? In fact, they are. Despite disowning Lara for her adventure semantics and refusing to act like an aristocrat, complying with their wishes and marrying some aristocrat dude, they showed up for the funeral. Yes, this was the part of the original story of Lara's parents and origins until they f***ed it up by retconning a lot of stuff and even changing her parents' name. This right here is probably the closest you can see them in the game and in the action. This is also the first time we see the Croft Manor in the FMV animation which is cool. You might already know that my love for the Croft Manor is infinite, and it shall remain to be as long as I live. Hmm, okay. Anyways, Winston is accompanied by the priest Patrick Dunstan and historian Charles Kane to the cozy room by the fireplace. These three stooges will be plot drives for the game. Their reminiscences will serve as a globetrotting adventure of our beloved Lara Croft and her search for many goodies. 
Their talk will send Lara into the room for the search of the Philosopher's Stone. Into the Russian submarine in search for the Spear of Destiny. Some remote Irish Black Isle infested with the creepy dead apparitions to do some incantations from the bestiary, to confront the demon and finally to steal the iris from the old ass Von Croy in his high-tech building. See, I told you that the run for the iris in the last revelation was so irrelevant. Old man got it anyways, no matter how fast we were. This is the time to get our revenge and snatch the iris from him, causing the friendship to turn south. This all sounds very promising to be honest. You would think that this would suggest a proper conclusion of the Quintology, adventure per excellence. But hey, I'm gonna dissect this game as much as I can in my fashion and at the same time hoping that I won't bore you to death. Is there anything new in this game? What can you possibly add? Visual-wise, the game looks pretty much the same as the last revelation. Even this main menu looks identical. See? Only the background landscapes are different then. Holy shit! Croft Manor is that you? Oh wow, they even put some bookshelves in the main lobby and stuff, but it's Croft Manor. But it's also a goddamn tease, because yes, we don't get to play it in the game at all. Such a pitiness. Or for the lack of the better expression, such a provocation. The new thing is the continuation from one story arc to another story arc. As we are effectively playing the conversation of the Three Stooges, the FMV cuts in segues into the spoken location and finally into the next game. And as you are approaching the finish of the story arc, the game segues into the conversation room again and goes to another location. This is kind of cool. It doesn't break the immersion of the game and also offers a multifarious experience since you are traveling to a vastly different locations. So, goodbye Egypt, you overly long yellow-brown adventure. Goodbye. Alara also learned a thing or two, so the gameplay moveset is expanded once again. The main and the obvious one is the ability to walk on a tightrope. As you can see, just walk and tap the opposite direction if she decides to randomly swing to the left or right to pull her back in the balance. There's no skill involved in this, so I question myself if this is even necessary in the game. If you would have a balance meter in the entire walk like, let's say, in Tony Hawk's Pro Skater when you do grind tricks, it would be a much better and much more challenging thing to do then it would make sense to me. This way, that move feels like redundant, unnecessary. Remember when you needed to turn Lara's ass in front of the screen to get out of high crawling spaces and how slow and tedious that was? Rejoice my friends, because this time you can actually get out by doing a front somersault. This is now faster. But beware, or sometimes you might end up in the ditch or a f***ing volcano. In the Colosseum. How abstract is that? She can now search the shelves to get some items and search the drawers for the same reason too. The lessons learned from the last revelation say that this suspicious looking drawer cabinets begs for the search. And indeed, you should do it because it's possible. She can also swing herself from the horizontal poles and jump to reach platforms. She can use a grappling gun to shoot the rope into a certain ceiling so she can swing it. Stealth tendencies are also expanded as Lara can combine the chloroform chemical with the cloth to neutralize the enemies without resorting to violence. She can even talk to her friend Zip via radio communication or something in the last story arc. Okay, am I actually playing Tomb Raider or Deus Ex? Now I'm properly confused. Human enemies are also given some mental capabilities, so they're not going to run blindly towards you and shoot you. It's like they would sometimes try to approach you carefully with some sort of a tactic, but this is still very primitive by design, so I guess it's better than nothing? Ragdoll mechanics does not exist in the year 2000, so when you kill them, their falling animation is fixed, so it can look funny like this. Yep, defying the laws of physics is the practice here. This time, in every story arc, Lara's inventory will be different. This means that weapons, ammo and items will not be carried across the stories. That's right, every new story brings new weapon pickups. The only exception is the island when we play as a 16-year-old Lara. Remember Angkor Wat? She's making a return for the whole three levels. But she's not carrying any weapon. I mean, it makes sense because she's only 16. In other words, she's too young to kill. So the levels needed to be made to introduce non-violent gameplay, which is a nice change of pace. So far so good, right? Well, it's time to pay a visit to Italy once again. This time, not Venice, but the capital city. The almighty Rome. The best place to do a rather risky business transaction is the one that has a big crowd. I guess we need to enter a certain amount of posh ingredient into the mix and we end up in the opera house when the big-headed Lara wants to exchange her money for the mercury stone in a quite sarcastic dialogue with these criminals. Now seriously, why is her head so big? She looks like a troll. Like these. Okay, never mind. So, 
a bit of acrobatics, thrown roses and standing ovations from the public and it's time to run away on a pizza delivery Vespa. Very convenient. Here comes this cartoonish chase scene that makes me cringe to be honest. Somebody actually approved this. Damn man. But this is even better. Ok, Lara slides under the fence and all that. But what's with this waiting for them with a smirk on the face stuff? How can you be so sure that the fence will hold the car impact? What if the fence is, I don't know, 3000 years old and just cracks and kills you? So stupid. But that's Tomb Raider. You know that the game needs to be devoid of all the sanity every once in a while. So, she walks away with the Mercury Stone. And as you can see, she was in a dress. And in the game, she is in her normal Tomb Raider clothes. I guess developing and animating the dress would take too much time in the game. So it's easy to pretend that she managed to get her dress changed somewhere in a millisecond. Okay, whatever. Craft Manor does not exist in this game, so you could wander in the streets of Rome and detour from the mission into this entrance. Yep, this right here is going to be a tutorial level. You know you can totally ignore it if you like, but if you feel like refreshing your skills, just go ahead and enter the opera backstage. What can be said about Rome? Unlike Venice from Tomb Raider 2 that is full of human enemies, these streets are quite empty. The design looks very believable, the colors of the buildings and such are done quite right, but it feels kinda soulless and you know that Rome is a very lively city by design. Look at this square, it looks so pretty, but it just lacks the atmosphere of a city. This is not a desolated location forgotten for several thousand years. I know it would be a wild task for core design to animate the friendly NPCs and make them run away if you wield your guns in front of them, but hey. Maybe a workaround in the vein of the monks from the Barkung monastery would be a good compromise, who knows. Anyways, you carry on with the level, and guess who is up there chilling in the balcony trying to shoot you? Yep, this is supposed to be the first encounter with the Larson from the original Tomb Raider. Yes, cowboyish blonde locks duke, red shirt and trousers coupled with the cheesy acting. That's him alright, but let's shoot the bastard down. But if you played Tomb Raider 1, you know how this goes. You spend a little bit of bullets on the guy and he vanishes away like nothing happened. Typical stuff. Now, at the end, you actually meet both Larson and Pierre, at least in the game engine. Look at these pricks. They feel like a clumsy comedic duo trying to do some serious business and getting constantly hurt in the process. Sort of like these two from Home Alone. To open the door beneath these three gargoyle heads or something, Lara needs to go to Trajan, Trajan's, Trajan's market to do some business. I really don't know how to spell it properly, so forgive me. Now this level has some piece of the action. Platforming around the area is fine by me. To get this big mechanism aligned so you can progress the game further and the game actually throws some challenges at you. Check out this metallic Roman headed octopus? The f*** is that? But these green eyes spell trouble my friend. You approach close enough and they shoot and kill you instantly with the green ray. Now, if you're familiar with the logic of the last revelation and you already have the revolver and scope, you know what it means now, do you? Yes, shoot those stupid goddamn eyes. It's so funny when you miss the eye and the head looks around in panic. Sort of like this. If you have metallic creatures like that, then this statue coming back to life shouldn't throw you out of the tracks at all. Now you are desynthesized to the sword swings or these harmful rays. A trusty shotgun and a bit of shooting will do the trick and pull the statue to misery. Job done. After a while, and with all the stuff collected, you approach the three gargoyle head thing door once again to confront Larson. I always loved this piece of the interaction right here. Behind you! Behind you! Behind you! Larson, behind you! Behind you! Behind you! Poor sod got thrown all the way back to the end of the yard and you know what the deal is. This is the boss battle. If you use the regular guns, this will take a while and you need to dodge the fireballs in order to successfully destroy these three gargoyles without being burned to a crisp. This battle is not hard by any means, you just need to be patient and that's all. Entering this magical door is interesting. Once you're in, you can't go out. You can't even get the stone over there because it would be damn too easy. Of course you need to take the involuntary detour first. But I'll forgive this because we are going to enter the Colosseum. Oh yeah! I happened to visit the Colosseum last year with my wife, but I never realized that the volcano is so close to the floor. Hmm, luckily I didn't have to do the platforming bit in real life because it would be quite a disaster and I'd be long dead and gone. Even though that might give the answer as to why the weather is so hot in Rome. Hmm, conspiracy theory right there. 
Anyways, I know I'm saying this a lot, but if you know what the Tomb Raider is, you can guess what kind of enemies would be thrown down into the pit. Oh yes, Alliance. These ones look way better than those in the Tomb Raider 1 Colosseum. And of course, Roman gladiators running at you and wielding swords. I like this timed section where you need to pull a steel string from the side and to unleash your platforming skills to grab an item before it's too late. It feels very classical, very Tomb Raider-ish. Check out the Colosseum. It's such a shame that it's just a background sprite. In my mind, I imagine it would be so cool if we could actually go to the center of the Colosseum and do some nasty platforming while avoiding gladiators. And that you have surreal ancient Roman ghost people watching it all while Caesar decides at the end if you are worthy or not. And if you pass, you get some artifact and they all vanish like nothing happened. So, Tomb Raider developers of the future, hire me as a screenplay writer. I promise I'll do you justice. Anyways, grabbing the item at the end segues into the FMV sequence of the three musketeers rambling about Lara saying that this was her first proper adventure. So it would seem that this Rome episode actually predates Natla's employment from the original Tomb Raider. But it begs the question, how the hell did Pierre and Larson survive all of their accidents in Rome? I guess they are really like this Home Alone duo, practically invincible, stupid but impossible to kill. I talk of the Anyways, this is the moment when our favorite freezer geezer Winston will finally hear the next story told by Charles Kane. Lara wouldn't tell him herself to protect him, but he deserves to know the story now. This time, Lara's trying to infiltrate a Russian base so she can get into the nuclear submarine that is ready to search the deep sea for the famous, but quite dangerous, artifact called the Spear of Destiny. If it was already known that the spear is so volatile by nature and it can cause severe explosions to the surroundings near it, why would anyone want to touch it in the first place? We already know that Lara has the ability to be incredibly stupid when it comes to artifacts because she's obsessed with them, but at least everybody else should be smart not to touch it. Maybe she wants to prevent it so it doesn't fall into the wrong hands? Oh well, I guess we need to undertake this disaster in the making just to prove a point. Unlike Rome, this story is set in the snow-filled remote base in Zapadnaya Litsa on the Barents Sea. It's very cold so it calls for a more appropriate dress code this time. By entering the base, we are introduced to, let's say, interesting mechanic. Yes, we are allowed to wander around the cargo area searching for clues, but if we stay too long at one place, a Russian mercenary will drop the crane and try to kill Lara. This is cool and it keeps us on toes all the time, until it's time to open the door and kill that joystick-wielding son of a bitch. Die, bastard! So, advancement of the level would reveal our two main antagonists. Everlasting USSR romanticizer Admiral Yarofov and Mafia boss Sergei Mikhailov, talking about rushing things up to prepare the sub for submerging. Yarofov has allowed this only because he and his crew need to put the bread on the table. And this Sergei is a ruthless, filthy, rich mafia bastard trivializing the act he wants to commit. Guess who's there to interrupt this party? Unfortunately, she'd be found by Yarofev and held captive without weapons. Fortunately, there's always a way to find an improvised crowbar to pry out the entrance to the ventilation. Until you find the trusty guns hidden in a drawer cabinet in some room, you better sneak up on this chef and... How did he figure out I'm approaching? Oh shit! Crawling should be stealthy, right? But no, you are supposed to walk up to him from behind and put him to a nice long nap. I mean this is just stupid because crawling is quieter and elusive by nature as opposed to walking. Oh well, whatever. Wandering around this submarine is really nothing special, nothing to raise your eyebrows about. All we have to do is prepare the batteries and oxygen tank to connect them to a suit console. Once you do that, you need to put the console onto the yellow diving suit. Now it's time to jump into it and... Whoa! What the hell is wrong with Lara's face? It looks so horrific. Look at these eyes, just look. These will give you recurring nightmares. To be honest, this deep sea dive section could have been something good, but it turns out to be such a waste of time. You are diving around, avoiding enemy subs until you find the cave where the Spear of Destiny lies. Of course this is not supposed to be an easy task, so the random explosion breaks one of the rusty steel beams free just to conveniently destroy Lara's air supply. Why, thank you very much. And now this is 40 fathoms all over again. Dive quickly back into the sub before air runs out. And that, my friends, is the entire level. Like I said, such a waste of time. Back at the sub, just when Lara is about to admire the spear, here comes Sergei with two minions demanding Lara to hand it to him. Turns out that Lara knows that the spear is dangerous, so she is trying to advise Sergei not to do anything stupid. And I was accusing her of being an idiot several minutes before. 
Oh, dearie me and my filthy mouth. Of course Sergei would listen to her. Not. So naturally the spear started to radiate the light and ultimately made an explosion that would kill him and sing the sub. Well, thank you very much, you greedy bearded bastard. Luckily, sinking is an infinite process in this game, so we have plenty of time to plan our escape. Running down the corridors while the water is only one foot tall is fine, but I always laugh when the game wants to be finally subtle in increasing the difficulty. I love when these electrical cables just happen to roll out in front of us just to make the water hazardous for our health. Electrocution is not sudden, but it will deplete our energy as long as we are in the water. But still, we need to take care of ourselves. I know you can shut the electricity down later in the level, but I just had to try this secret while the water is still electrical. My short scientific conclusion upon this topic is this. It's not possible to collect this secret without using at least one medipack, so don't do it. Don't be an idiot like me. It's expensive to both Lara's health and your nerves, believe me. Finding Yarofev lying down being wounded is a sad situation. When you hear him having regrets of sorts to this whole situation, you know, being an honorable admiral being reduced to taking money from the scum of the earth just to survive, it makes you feel sorry for the whole thing and actually sympathize with him a bit. He'll even help Lara to plan her escape and do what every captain of the ship does. If it goes down, I go down with it. Don't try to stop me, woman. Lara shows her human side and offers him an escape, but he refuses. Pride is at a stake. Only speak nicely of me when I die, please. As you would know by now, this calls for the transition into the conversation of the three wise men so we can jump into the third story. And now we are coming to the interesting part of the game. This time, we played this entire story arc as a young teenage dirtbag Lara Croft following father Patrick Dunstan to the Black Isle. A rumor has it that the place has some supernatural activities that needed to be investigated. Since there is no absolute way that core design will portray an underage kid like Lara in this instance having weapons, the gameplay mechanic would be slightly different. By that I mean they would need to make the environmental adjustments to involve more platforming and doing creative thinking, in other words, solving puzzles, rather than shooting enemies. It's a really nice change of pace of the game. Sure, you could argue that it drifts away from the Tomb Raider formula once again, but let's be real. By the time Tomb Raider Chronicles has arrived, anything that would make things different and rather interesting would be great. And you could see that Chronicles is really trying to grasp your attention by diversifying the story and gameplay elements. I should give core design props for that. However, seems to be that it didn't stop there. This entire section gives out some horror vibes. The entire ambience, atmospheric sounds, the landscape, less color saturation, overall darkness like you're playing Tomb Raider 3 all over again. It all gives this creepy, unsettling vibe. Feels like a mix of Tim Burton movies, medieval games and some traditional horror movie themes. Check this cutscene out. A sudden appearance of this demonic hanged corpse? Now that's terror. Imagine being 16 years old and stumbling upon this situation. That's terror. No wonder Lara developed such nerves of steel over the years. What's an occasional gunpoint from some stupid human enemy as opposed to this? Just an easy stroll through the park, right? That's terror. While you need to constantly move around so this stupid imp doesn't hurt you, the overall action of the game would be reduced to have a slingshot to do this. Or using a torch to burn the tree root. After all, a hanged corpse wants a heart. If these little creeps start to be rather too persistent with their annoyance, then check this out. One little iron clapper and there they go. Total vanish action! Not to be confused with a product of the same name. Or this torch can come in handy and these little shits will run around like crazy. This serves them right. The theme of creepiness would be carried over to the labyrinth chapel full of undead creatures like these semi-invincible skeletons trying to slice me into a selection of nice steaks. Or this awesome looking grim reaper without sight. Every time you interact with something, he appears out of nowhere doing something. I guess instead of being afraid, we need to follow him. He was scary back in the day though, I'll admit. Oh look, he's going for a book, but he ain't gonna grab it? I guess this is our chance to get it. That bestiary surely has some wild incantations to be cast out and... Oh, it's a damn rotating room labyrinth thing. Good luck solving that out. 
To go even further, there are some lightning spirits you need to follow just to find Father Patrick and... What? Did he bleach his hair? Is he having a midlife crisis now? This story is crazy. This time we have otherworldly entity we need to get disposed of. A f***ing demon horseman who also wants to slice us into a nice salami or something. Okay, so he needs to get a lesson in violence. Or maybe just exorcism. So what do we do? A lot of rope swinging just like this to get a crowbar while imps want to kill us. Or a lot of slope jumping like in a good old days just for what? What do you think? Something special? Hmm? Something worthwhile? Hmm? 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 Just so we can pry out some chalk? Give me a break, man. What a waste of my time. Writing some evil spells on the floor will do? Hmm. Absolutely nothing except trigger our demon even more so Father Patrick needs to come to the rescue. The demon will capture Father and keep him with himself locked inside the barn until Lara figures out the way to rescue him. This old mill section looks so picturesque, but it's holding one interesting gameplay mechanic underwater. There's actually a suspicious underwater cage left alone, and on the opposite end, a red demon diving around something that appears to be a silver coin. If it sees you trying to steal it, it will attack, but luckily Lara will kick its ass so she can go away. The trick is to steal the coin when demon is not looking, just to lure it to the cage and lock it inside. Very cool, but it took me a while to figure it out because I thought that the demon would always see me trying to steal the coin. I didn't know he has a field of vision. Is this Metal Gear Solid? I know, I know, it's the same deal with the chef and his field of vision in the submarine. I know. So in essence, you need to do all of this just to put the mill on a halt mode, so you can grab a secret. Nah, it's for the plot advancement. But if you're like me, you're gonna do this secret the hard way, while the water current is still on. Just so you can have a 5 second personal satisfaction and just to prove absolutely nothing. Anyways, our horseman demon becomes rather erratic, so it's time to stop. Lara will cast out some of the names until she says the right one. Well, the horseman is now stuck and Lara has power over him. I just love how he shouts all of the threats and shits and Lara says this. Be quiet. Ah, poor old lost soul. It's time to go somewhere high tech this time. Mr. Wong Croy owes us something. Back to where you belong. If I remember correctly from the interviews from the year 2000, this last section of the game was developed only because people wanted something in the vein of Nevada levels from the Tomb Raider 3. Apparently they liked high security complex and Area 51 levels so much that they wanted to experience something similar once again. And core design surely delivered the promise. And I'm not being sarcastic here. It feels like they wanted to squeeze as many ideas into this one as possible, but they made some questionable choices to be exact. For example, you don't have your trusty guns with limitless ammo. So, ammo is limited and there is plenty of stuff that requires intervention from the firearms. Especially the last level, Red Alert. If you run out of bullets, you're essentially soft-locking yourself and you cannot beat the game. It's not a game bug per se, but an unintentional bad design choice. So ammo and medipack preservation is a must, but Von Croy Industries is one very tough section to beat. Trust me. 13th floor is the level where you'll spend some time in the ducts observing these oddly shaped ventilators. No really, tell me you don't see what I see. Hmm? Anyways, do you remember these? Did you miss these rotating lasers? They have the same effect here as they had in Tomb Raider 3. They'll quickly deplete Lara's energy, so tight maneuvering is a must. Took me quite a time to realize that you need to use the hammer instead of bullets to open the padlock. Because bullets apparently destroy the entire ventilation shaft and then you are f***ed. Getting up at the 16th floor will give you some Deus Sex slash Metal Gear Solid vibes. Yep, crawling behind crates to avoid being spotted and stealing stuff from the guard sleeping on duty. That's such a Tomb Raider moment right there, isn't it? Well, I've conducted yet another scientific test to determine how short-sighted are the guards in question. Just look at them posing over there. Shall we go now? Oh, we're actually doing well, and... Almost there, almost there... Oh shit, they spotted us! Okay, pull the weapon out and waste them all. Yeah, so much for stealth stuff. It's not really refined in this game. Oh yes, there is yet another new mechanic you didn't know this game has. It's the ability to threaten the NPCs. For example, in this case, you need two people to pull the cards in the slot readers simultaneously. 
So use a gun to target the nearby NPC, but don't shoot him. Turns out you are able to talk him into helping you. So cool, but once again, I think this one should have been mentioned somewhere so we can know that Lara can do it actually. Anyways, Iris is nearby and much to Von Croy's dismay, it's nearly ready for a pickup. Nearly because it's still deadly as seen on this scene. Turns out it needs to be shut down so we can grab it and finalize our revenge. Once the Iris is in Lara's possession, it's time to go to the next level. This one is gonna play the so-called 16 year old Lara trick on us. That means that we need to submit the weapon on the left white counter so this big ass scanner won't go berserk. As you can see, one crate holds an important item and the other has something that probably looks like a bomb. Well, curiosity killed the cat, what can I say? Kids, don't do this at home. Since Lara has no weapon at her disposal, searching the drawers and cupboards will reveal another well-known combo. Chloroform and cloth for the guard neutralization. Also, check out this card with the code written on it. I'm telling you, many stealth game ideas were crammed into this one. After a bit of fiddling with the elevators, we are coming to the important question. Shall we run for those two medipacks or not? What do you think, huh? Zip is shouting to close the doors since this is an ambush, but these two are so tempting. Okay, let's do it. Alright, here we go. One down, one to go. Okay, got him, now run for the elevator. Damn, they're killing me, run! Okay, after a brief conclusion, I think this is not worth it. These assholes damaged me too much so I spent one of the medipacks anyway. Oh yeah, and don't forget to press the buttons again or you will learn how to die by elevator freefall. Damn! Lara! Lara! You broke? You ain't dead, is you? Come on girl, answer me! This level even has a sniper scope of someone trying to kill Lara. Welding torches trying to open the blast door while we need to walk up to the switches. If we run, the turrets will shoot us. And there is even teleport. Holy shit, it's just too much. One little industry has all of this high tech stuff? Anyways, this entire level is sort of circular until you shut off the scanner so you can pick up the weapon and finish it. But where's the right door? Can you spot this fire extinguisher over there? Shoot it and see it for yourself. And now ladies and gentlemen, we are entering the last level called Red Alert. As you would imagine, this one is tough as nails, so I hope you have preserved plenty of ammo and medipacks. You'll need them seriously, and save the game strategically. Now, this time nothing should come as a surprise to you, because the game wants to throw anything it can to you, to kick you off your tracks. Starting even from these collapsing stairs, there is all the wrongdoing from that annoying helicopter. Even this wall kicking with the foot. I'm not so sure if this mechanic was done anywhere else in the game. When you see these lasers, do they remind you of one particular game? If they do, which one is it? Let me give you 5 seconds to answer. 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, beep. It's incorrect. The answer is Barbie Race and Ride. Nah, of course it's MGS1 with these up and down moving lasers, but unlike them, this one and Tomb Raider are deadly, so you can only pass them if they become invisible for a brief moment in time. Like I said, this level will try to throw anything in front of you. Grappling hook to shoot the ceiling for a rope so you can jump on those markings on the wall to shimmy across? So mouthful, but yes, this level has it. This bald cyborg terminator type enemy that you need to flood with the water and then shoot him so the electrocution does the rest? Yes, this level has it exactly like that. Don't even try to kill him the old fashioned way because it's futile and you will waste a lot of bullets. And like I said earlier, if you run out of bullets, you can count that as a game over. You really need to kill the guy to get one part of the helipad key. The rest of the level is the one that rises up the difficulty by a lot. Not only do you need to run away from the helicopter shooting at you, you also need to time the jumps because the floor would be destroyed beneath you as you run. Except when the bug happens so the floor stays intact. And the same floor becomes destroyed as you turn back and you run away from another bold cyborg? What a mess. The next bug can happen if that stupid cyborg gets stuck in the pits when trying to chase you. It's not something that happened to me, but I heard that it happened to a lot of people. And he needs to chase you so you can lock him up in the gas chambers like so. I presume that you know where this is going, right? It's rootless, but we need to do it. Uh, through gas room exploration and pulling some levers, we put the gas into the room where the cyborg is so we can watch him choke to death. He has that other part of the key so we can assemble the full key. So it's all good and it's time to run away and... Lasers? What the fuck? They're not supposed to be turned on. Turns out that the game has thrown me a bug so these 
fucking lasers are permanent here. And the finishing of the level is just one minute away. Yes, this level is infamous for having several game breaking bugs. I think there are guides telling where it's safe to save the game before you go into the sections that are prone to bugs. So I needed to load the game half the level before so I could finish it. And I finally did. Lara has done it and successfully escaped the Von Croy Industries. And now it's time for the three Stooges to finish their stories and lamentations. However, turns out that the Von Croy was adamant to search for Lara in the pyramid ruins. The boy has led him to the discovery of something. We have found her, Von Croy says after getting the backpack into the air. Found her. And no you didn't find her you dumbass idiot, you found the backpack. Lara could still be dead somewhere in the ruins for all we know. But we also know that she is actually alive and will be for at least 20 something years. As long as the interest for her still exists. Unlike this video that will probably turn out to be too long for anybody's sanity, Tomb Raider Chronicles is indeed a very short experience. I mean, just 13 levels, that's short. And the levels are shorter by design if we compare them to the levels of for example Tomb Raider 2 or 3 and their overall length. So that's why I feel that this sequel feels very much forced and sometimes completely unnecessary. I mean, for the most part, you don't even have any boss to beat. Only the Rome section has some of them, but these other three stories? Absolutely not. That's actually a shame because the staple of the Tomb Raider games is to have a boss battle after you are approaching the finish of the last level of a certain section. Without bosses, it feels like something crucial is missing. Yes, I can see you area 51 without boss level. Yes, but now you can leave, shut the door please. Anyways, out of all of the originals, Chronicles hold the lowest Metacritic score. And whether you like it or not, that means something. That means that the game sucks. Nah, I'm just kidding. But to somewhat defend the game, Chronicles has some of the interesting ideas in the vein of the young Lara Croft section or all of the new moves and stuff in the Von Croy Industries. You couldn't say that there was no certain effort spent into making the stories and levels themselves. Too bad some of those levels are just too short. Just when you think that the story is about to unfold and you'll tackle the mystery of every artifact you are about to raid, it just goes away into another story because you have supposedly beat the levels. And that feels so soon and anticlimactic. Like getting late for the first time. You finish before you even have a chance to properly start and enjoy yourself. Shame. And also, there's always this question of the classic Tomb Raider feel. While the last revelation had a fair share of Tomb Raiding, with Chronicles, it's like core design forgot once again what the title of the game is. Running around in the streets of Rome, that's not raiding tombs. Running around inside the submarine, that's not tomb raiding. Running around in the high-tech building, once again, so far away from anything tomb raider related. To be ironic, the young Lara story is the closest you will get to tomb raider feel. Desolation, graves, abandoned churches, mills and stuff. I mean, it's still far away from something epic, but the atmosphere makes up for it even if it sometimes goes heavily into the horror feel. Playing the game, you can actually feel core design getting tired of using the same formula, so maybe that's why the settings, levels themselves and the ideas crammed in are so out of place sometimes. It feels like they want to change the game so much into something else, but they can't. There's no time and there's no will. It all just feels like a rushed contractual obligation that needed to be done just to satisfy the corporate heads. We all know that Eidos ain't gonna let Lara Croft and the entire Tomb Raider franchise go to waste just yet. But you know what? It's so easy to shit on this game and accuse core design of being so lazy to make the same game 5 times. But I think that's just too harsh. Name me one developer who made 5 decent games 5 years in a row. Go ahead. Please, don't find it because I'm not ready to lose the argument that badly. Yes, the games wouldn't be radical in gameplay design and yes, they could get apocalyptically boring over the course of several sequels. But if you ever want to return to the roots and play some classic Tomb Raider, you have 5 offerings to choose from. And that's okay if you ask me. Maybe we could conclude that the Tomb Raider Chronicles is a victim of a circumstance. Nobody wanted to play something that would be characterized as yet another uninspiring Tomb Raider game. Especially not in the year 2000. But when you play it for the first time in several years, then the game feels better than expected. Still, it's not going to beat all the predecessors by any means. But it's not that bad. Could be better if it weren't for those stupid bugs in the last level. But what can you do now? Ah! 
So this is it. This is finally it. This is the last piece of our beloved classic Tomb Raider Quintology. Right now, I'm not so sure how to feel about it. Am I getting emotional now? Hmm, maybe. For a tiny bit. But one thing is for certain. This has been one hell of a ride with many of you people watching my videos and commenting. And I cannot thank you enough for that. From the bottom of my heart, it really means a lot. And I mean a lot. 900 millions, trillions, billions, gazillions, whatever, mega, super, ultra, wide, a lot. And I hope you like this video as well. Yeah. And now, is it time to tackle one of the best games in the gaming universe?